By the latter end of 1776, the Continental Army's chance of standing firm against the British was frail. Winter had come on in December, and most of the men did not even have shoes. For most of fall and the beginning of, of winter, they had been pursued by the redcoats across New Jersey until both armies settled into winter quarters. Washington's army was now encamped on the western side of the Delaware River. And morale had never been lower. Ever since Washington took control of the Continental Army in July of 1775, the army was his, and he had first forced the British to evacuate Boston. But then, after knowing that British General William Howe would strike again, he moved south to New York City and set up his headquarters there. Then the British attacked and drove Washington by. Excellent tactics and numbers out of New York City, across the Hudson River into New Jersey, then all the way west to the Delaware River. Howe, with his main army, pursued to the eastern banks of the Delaware River. Then, deciding to settle down into winter quarters, stationed garrisons all along the bank, then pulled back his main army to New York City. He was confident that when the spring came, he would crush the Continental Army. By this defeat, Washington had not only lost the confidence of his men, but even the support of some members of the Continental Congress, who were already talking about replacing him with Charles Lee, one of his senior officers. Patriots who had been so confident in their cause now turned aside to support the British, and most of his army had deserted him. Things were looking very bad for Washington. The commander himself was in no better mood, but he knew that he had to do something, or else the entire revolution would collapse. He had one last chance to prove himself to the world and try to regain the lost morale of his officers and men. But it was already deep in winter, and the year 1776 was waning to an end. He had one last shot to it. He thus began to send out reconnaissance forces at an attempt to find some point on the opposite bank in which he could seek to attack. From the report sent back to him, Washington resolved that he would begin a winter campaign, starting with taking the town of Trenton across the river. Trenton was a small hamlet with about one hundred houses, but now occupied by Hessians, British hired German troops. Whom Howe had posted to defend against any American assault, desperately needing a victory and a satisfactory end of the year, Washington made plans to assault Trenton, then drive further on. Even as most of his men had deserted during their flight across New Jersey, he still commanded about three thousand men. In comparison, there were only about fifteen hundred Hessians in Trenton. Still, Washington, careful to acquire victory, planted spies into Trenton, who got into close contact with their plans. He thus learned that Joanne Rawl commanded the garrison at Trenton, who had kept his soldiers alert throughout the day, but had not bothered to dig defensive fortifications outside of the town. Washington began disrupting Trenton by attacking supply lines and setting small ambush parties. Who fought small skirmishes with the Hessians while he and his officers prepared for the attack? The American plan was simple: two dispatch forces would be sent out, one to the north and one to the south. These would prevent the enemy from escaping, and reinforcements come from coming. Then the main assault force, consisting of, of about 2,400 men. Would cross the river and march 16 miles south to attack Trenton from the north and the south. It was planned that the expedition would begin at midnight, thus coming to Trenton at dawn. What was more, the night of the attack was Christmas, so as well prepared the, pre the Hessians could be, they would not have dreamed that the enemy should do battle on Christmas. Thus, Washington began his midnight expedition. By ferrying his troops across the icy river to New Jersey on the, on the opposing bank, however, this process was delayed by a snowstorm that came rolling in, 
so that already this secret assault was later than scheduled. The even more gruesome march south in snowy conditions in Trenton battered the men's morale greatly. For most of them did not even own boots or adequate clothing to stand against the weather. Reports that ammunition was getting wet and that morning was approaching further challenged the high hopes of the men. Even Washington began to get doubtful, for the snow came down even more bitter, and it seemed that it would be well daylight before they reached Trenton. Still, Washington went forward with his plan and split his force into three. One of them, under John Sullivan, would attack from the south. Another, under Nathan Green, would attack from the west. And the final part would be led by Washington himself to attack from the north. The assault would be additionally aided by friendly artillery fire from all the way across the river. The snowstorm that had delayed them had put all the same the Hessians off guard. So an eight o'clock struck and dazed Hessians heard the musket fire of a full-scale American attack, they were completely unprepared. Washington had struck first from the north. The men of the outposts were quickly defeated and forced to flee back towards the town. Soon, more and more Hessians rushed out from their barracks and piled up to give a resistance, but their ranks were so hastily formed that all they could do was to maintain a steady retreat. It was around this time that Sullivan and Green arrived, and the defense on those sides of the town collapsed. The artillery fire from the other side of the river began aiding the patriots. The Hessians began grouping together in town, and the three main regiments came into battle. Raw, seeing that the enemy was on all three sides of him, and that they were firing cannon at his troops, sent one of his regiments to try and take the enemy's artillery, but this advance failed, and instead took heavy casualties by fierce musket fire. The American advance was not hindered, and Rob, seeing that the situation was desperate, had his own batteries opening fire, but within ten rounds, most of the artillerymen were killed, and five of the six cannons were captured by the Americans. With their positions devastated by American fire, the Hessians retreated out of the town to a field nearby, and there they tried to make a counterattack. Raw led his forces, pushing forward back towards Trenton, but Washington's men were well in position, and as the Hessians came into range, fierce volleys came down from all three sides of Raw's men. Shattered by this firing, the Hessians, taking heavy Heavy casualties fled to back to an orchard. There, pursued by Americans, they were surrounded and finally surrendered. This battle, unlike the Battle of Bunker Hill, was a decisive American victory. On the brink of defeat, this battle helped the Patriots regain confidence. Those who had began siding with the British now turned back towards Washington. In the next months, more and more men entered the Continental Army, and this initial battle triggered a series of American victories that we will see later on. Thus, you can see that this battle is surely one of the major turning points in the American Revolution.